Helen, when you were going to join the service, where were you living at the time? What state? I was living in uh, <coughs> Chicago, Illinois. Okay, and this the war has been going on for a while? Uh, actually, the uh, war started in uh, December of 1941, and I remember uh, watching a football game that Sunday when it started. And thereafter, in early 42, uh, my cousin and I uh, decided that we were going to enlist in the Air Force. And my cousin was two years older than I was. So how, how old were you at the time? I was 15. Oh, can sneak so, in. So uh, I had been uh, uh, delivered as a baby by uh, a midwife next door in the only evidence I had of a birth certificate was a baptismal certificate from the church. And my cousin and I devised a method of raising my age to 17 on a baptismal certificate, which, which sufficed. And actually we went down, I believe in the late spring of 42, and went to uh, Army Air Force headquarters and I got rejected and he got accepted. Uh, wait, a minute, wait a minute, how come you got rejected? Why? I got rejected because I couldn't read the red line in a map, uh, a air type map. And they, they said I was colorblind, but I'm not colorblind in the sense that I can't tell colors. I just couldn't find the red line on the map. So I was pretty despondent and went back home. And my parents were both immigrants, so there wasn't a lot from of... From where? Uh, Hungary. And uh, they, uh, they didn't seem to kind of go along with anything other than I wanted to be in the service and they were not against it, okay? And so I came home a little sad about all this and after uh, oh, a couple of months of, well, maybe a month or so of being sad, I decided that maybe I ought to join the Navy. So I went to Naval Headquarters and of course they were pretty busy at the time and uh, I went through the examination and they said, okay, you're going to be all right. You just got to come back. I don't know when it was August or September. I came back. By this time, I had turned 16. But I had been accepted by the Navy. I just had a report on August or September. I forget the exact day. So I, when I reported, I reported with my little clothes and 25 bucks that my mother gave me. And I wound up... Uh, getting in the Navy and going to Great Lakes for my training. Okay. That's your basic training, the main Great Lakes right. station. And, uh, how long, that was eight weeks or how long was that? I was e either eight or 12, I'm not quite sure, but I never did get home from there even though I was only 40 miles away. <laughs> and uh, when I was through with basic training and I forgot how they dispersed us, you know, everybody had probably nothing to say about where they were going. And uh, I found that I was going to be transferred to uh, the University of Iowa in Ames for further training at the college. And I didn't know what I was going to be trained for at the time. That was my transfer. And uh, I wound up going there. And I wound up going to what they called electrician school for quite some time. Uh, see, this would have taken me through the end of 42, back in spring of uh, 43. So uh, while I was in electrician school, uh, I was like everybody else, I was just playing football, going to school, getting medical care, going to Des Moines on leave, enjoying myself. And I had a, a dental problem. I think I had one cavity and a, uh, a young lieutenant that took care of my needs in the dental part department said, have you ever considered uh, doing something else in the Navy? And I said, no. He says, uh, well, I have a suggestion for you. He says, you got a pretty good set of teeth. And he said, you know, if you volunteer for the United States Submarine Service, you can uh, acquire, I think it was nine or, nine or 11 days of leave, uh, traveling orders. And, uh, and then he it sounded like a bribe. Well, it, it definitely was a bribe, but I, I, I never did know what the motive was that prompted him to prompt me. 
So, uh, and he said the other part of it is that if you qualify in a submarine service, there is extra pay, which turned out to be a very good truism because the, uh, you not only got 50% uh, uh, extra pay once you qualified as a submariner, but you also got, if you went overseas, you uh, also got another 20% raise for going overseas. So that was quite an increase for someone that was of the low end of the deal, like a fireman first class or a seaman first class, you know. So I thought that was a good idea, and that way I could get home. So I grabbed it and uh, wound up going home for the better part of the 10 days and then going on to New London, Connecticut for submarine school, which itself was a <laughs> really a, an entry into a new world, a very strict school for both physical and emotionally. Yeah. Well, <laughs> submarine school introduction is that there is one chief petty officer named Spritz that was the commander-in-chief of the submarine school. And it was uh, utter discipline on his part distributed to the recruits like myself in terms of proper dress, proper manners, proper etiquette as far as officers go and everything else. That was the first step. The second step was physical in terms of uh, uh, I was not appointed as an electrician, but that's what I evolved into going through submarine school because of my previous training in, at uh, Ames, Iowa. Uh, not that what I learned in Iowa applied to submarines, but it was electricians, okay? What you do in submarine school is you get tested physically for pressure. Uh, you get into a pressure chamber where they expose you to 50, 60 pounds of pressure, see if you're, you can handle it in terms of equating the pressure in your ears while you're in there and all that. And the rate of failure there was probably around 80%, 90%. Because, you know, people couldn't keep up with the pressure and it popped their drums. Uh, if you succeeded there, your next step in the physical thing was escaping in a, with a Munson lung from a tank. And they put you in a 100-foot tank and equip you and you get in a little bubble they take and flood it until the pressure is equal so that you're in there with your lung in about six inches of space and uh, that evens out with the pressure of the water on the other side and then they you have your lung full of uh, oxygen and then you climb out at 100 foot of water at a pace so that you don't explode mm -hmm. and you go up and there's knots in the rope and of course, there are divers and everybody watching you to make sure that you don't, you don't have a problem. And you do that. And then after you, let's say you've succeeded in both of those things, and then you go through a period of emotional evaluation. Uh, you go through a battery of oh, anywhere from two to six doctors or psychologists. I don't know whether they were laymen or doctors or what they were, but. You get in a room with someone and they try you on every aspect of, of life that you could ever imagine somebody would ask you questions about. Because you're going to be confined in a small cubicle with 80 guys you know, for long periods of time. And uh, that was the big problem. I guess it is still today. And uh, you have to go through that and, and go through the emotions of, of pass, passing, so to speak. And I never knew what passing meant other than you go on to the next one and you don't have to go back to the first one. So uh, I did have one experience there. I forgot to button my pea coat one day when I was walking from one unit to another and I passed by Chief Spritz and I had an open button. I wound up sleeping on a cement floor for four nights. That was the kind of thing it was. So the mortality rate was high, and then <clears throat> after you've gone through the passing of the emotions and the physical part and uh, behaving, so to speak, then you start your training in the submarine. And they had what they called S-boats and O-boats there that they used for training purposes. What's the difference between an S and O-boat? Uh, age, primarily. Oh, okay. 
the O-boats were the first submarines that were around, you know, right after World War I, I think. And the S-boats were later built. And then we went into another class of boats, and I forgot the name of them now. But uh, it was like the boat I was on. I, I don't remember the names of them. But in any case, you start going out on sea trials and learning how to how the submarine functions when it's moving along. And you know, you you are a student, and somebody else is doing else, and you're watching and learning. So after you go through that training for, and, and this takes quite a while, all of this takes quite a while. So I'm into just about turning 17 now, and the upper part is 43, you know, spring of 43. And, and I graduate submarine school, and I make it. And I'm one of the, I don't know, 12, 15% that makes it. The other 85% are, they used to call them, uh, you get destroyer duty on, on Pier 92 in New York City. You know, you get assigned to a destroyer. And nobody wanted to go to this destroyer because I guess that's pretty rough Navy duty. Anyway, that's, that's, that was my next trip was that I got, I got to stop at home, but not for nine or ten days on the way back. But I was being shipped to Mare Island for... Shipment overseas. Where's Mare Island at? Uh, California. Okay. All right. I, it's some, it's some uh, boat basin or sea base or whatever it was, a Navy base. And they just put us up in quarters and, you know, I laid around on canvas for a week or two waiting until we were all assigned to a uh, troop ship. And the troop ship that we got assigned to was the uh, USS Lure Line. It was a... Uh, passenger ship that had been converted and uh, it carried, I don't know, five, six thousand people. I mean, it was, it was interesting. So I went overseas on the Lure Line with Army, Navy, you name it. I mean, they're just a bunch of people. Now, you're talking about you went through the Pacific overseas. Right. It went to the Pacific and, and it was a nonstop to, journey from uh, California right. to Brisbane, Australia. That's where I wound up being, and I don't know where the rest of them all went. But <laughs> I had, you know, I had some buddies that were with me, of course, obviously. And we wound up in Brisbane, and we were assigned to the submarine base in Brisbane on the Brisbane River, which I took my wife to see last 2005. I wanted to show her where it was. People that lived there in the condos didn't even know there was a submarine base underneath them once. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that's where I wound up, and I was assigned to a crew. Uh, I became one of a crew, and there, they had like probably six crews, and we were known as relief crews. I mean, the, these particular crews that were on the base. And what happened is the submarine would come in from a war patrol, and uh, all the members of that particular active submarine would get a what we call the luxury two week leave at a hotel in town or something and you know everything for your comfort and fun. And the relief crew would take over. We would recondition the boat, fix everything, get it ready, sail it, make sure it's all there. And then the crew would come back and we'd go back to work somewhere else and they'd take off again on another run as we call them. So that was our duty there. And uh and mostly I was a little, how would you say it, disappointed that I'd spent all this time and all of a sudden, you know, I, I was crabbing in myself and I realized that I physically was 17 years old now. I turned 17 in Brisbane. And at that time, Roosevelt made a statement, you know, a public statement that uh, none of our Fighting men are going to be sent overseas when they're 17 years old. We're going to make sure that uh, we get more mature people out there and not send children over there to fight. So I guess I complained out loud or something or told my buddies. And the next thing you know, you know, somebody called me in and said, I thought you were 19. I said, no, I'm 17. Why, why did you lie? I said, I want to be in the service. So I got to be, 
And I had, I had like a finger put on me that I did something wrong. And so I asked one of my leaders, I guess what he was, maybe a chief petty officer or something that I worked with, I can't remember. I said, what's going on? He said, well, they're gonna, they're gonna inquire your parents, you know, what to do because, you know, you lied and, and I, well, it took about a month. And I got back a note that my parents said I was fine. They thought that I had followed all the instructions and everything was okay. So they, they didn't even realize, or if they did, they didn't say anything. But they, in their own manner, okayed my being there at 17. So from then on, life went on as usual. And I got in some kind of trouble, and the trouble I got into got me a captain's mask. And they, you know what a captain's mask no, is? No, what, what does that mean? I don't know, I've never heard of it. Well, I went, I went over leave a couple, couple nights. I was, I was really upset that I wasn't fighting the war, that I was just sitting around being a mechanic in the garage. And uh, the captain's mass is you go in front of the officers and they're going to determine what the cause was and what the punishment's going to be and all of that. And, and I got the captain's mass and the result was that I did, <clears throat> I did a little time locally, and, but I got what I wanted. They transferred me to Fremantle, which is the other side of Australia, to the submarine base in Fremantle. And I got there by taking the train with a 5,000 other people in the service across Australia and the big desert, which was the most interesting trip. How many all. hours did this take you? It took days. Oh, day, okay. It, it's, it's a one-track train, you know, with sidings where you stop and the, the army or whoever was running the train had, you know, cooks and you ate and, uh, and the native people would come and uh, try and barter with you for food and show you tricks and all that. I mean, it was an unbelievable journey. And it wasn't in passenger cars, it was in box cars. Oh. So it was an interesting trip. When I got to Fremantle, I couldn't have been there more than two or three weeks. And I was assigned to the USS Croker submarine as an electrician to go on a run. And I, I, that's when the, when the war started for me in terms of going to war. And uh, that was rather interesting. Stop. <clears throat> How are we doing? Doing fine. I, mean, I don't have to shut it off because I can cut oh, it and edit okay. and all that sort of stuff. I'm going to have a drink. Yep. Anyway, that's... <laughs> now get your drink first and then go back so we don't get the glass clinking with the microphone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now you're, now you're going to be aboard a submarine as an electrician? As an electrician, yes. Okay. And the electrician, my position physically in a submarine was I had a bunk in the after torpedo room. And my job was, the next room was called the maneuvering room where the, the big switches were for the electric motors and things. And then, of course, <coughs> Being on a submarine, now I finally got to qualify to get that 50%. I was getting the 20% the minute I got on or when I went overseas, but I had to qualify and get my dolphins. And dolphins are like similar to getting the wings when you learn how to fly. You know? So you got the dolphins when you had qualified that you knew how to operate every piece of machinery on that submarine, okay? Where'd you get the training to do this then? On the submarine. On the submarine, so yeah. you, they go through all there the- was, Well, there were, some of it came while we were in submarine school, okay? And that, that kind of counted for you. But the submarines that were in the school were not up to date like the one I was on. The one I was on was called, in, in the expression of submariners, it was called a thin skinner and it was called a thin skinner because it, it was tested down to 400 feet. It tested. But we found out that you can go further than that and still live. <laughs> and the other part of it was it was 300 feet long and it carried close to 100 people. 
So when I say I had a bunk in the after torpedo room, I shared that bunk with two other guys. Now, what, what, what class submarine was this again? Well, it, it was there a class given name. I usually call them class. Yeah. Uh, we'll hold on. We'll hold figure on. that out. Okay. Okay. You want to know now? No. We'll figure it out later. I, yeah. We can figure it out. Yeah. Now you're on the submarine. You're out. This is a shakedown cruise or normal patrol now? There were no shakedown cruises. This, this submarine had been active before, and I just became a crew replacement. Okay. And uh, the first, first run I made on the USS Croker uh, was kind of exciting uh, in that when we started the run, we went up along the, I, I don't remember the direction, uh, uh, Fremantle is, I, I think, on the western side of Australia. We were going up along the coast and we broke off our sound gear, which is a, an extension like a periscope, but it's a sound gear that comes out of the bottom of the submarine. And apparently we hit a narrow spot and broke it off. And so we pulled into some cove, an uninhabited cove while we tried to repair the damage. And I wasn't involved in that other than standing guard duty and making sure that we weren't going to get caught by somebody or whatever it was. Once we got it repaired, we went on uh, through Indochina. There's a strait called Lombok Strait, where most of the submarines had to go through Lombok Strait to, in order to get into the upper sea of Japan and up in, in that area where the Philippines are and all that area in there. Otherwise, you'd have to go all the way around Indochina, and that was prohibitive in the sense that mileage and how far you could go. So uh, from there, uh, we, what I remember correctly is, uh, we were part of a team that teamed together to take an admiral up to Subic Bay in the Philippines. And at the time this was occurring was that the Japanese were being partially driven back out of Manila, and we were kind of retaking the Philippines. MacArthur was going back, and troops had landed, and Subic Bay, we had already entered Subic Bay as a naval force, and we had two or three submarine tenders in the bay that were servicing submarines in Subic Bay like they would in Fremantle or Brisbane if they came in. So we had another station, and we were to deliver this admiral. And I say we because we were part of it, but I don't know if we delivered him or one of the other submarines did because we played uh, the game of cat and mouse, you know. Where's the mouse? You know, we had, he apparently was on one submarine and then transferred to another for safety reasons. And so this occurred because we were going to go to Lombok Strait with him. Somebody was. And we all got pretty well battered going through Lombok Strait because you have to run it on the surface. And the Japanese had, and you're talking about, you know, one of the enlisted men telling you the story now. <laughs> I was a talker in the after torpedo room when we were active. That was my job during war, war station seals. And we were running through Lombok Strait, and the Japanese had a version of our like mosquito boats, uh, torpedo boats, and they, they were just trying to attack us. And it's 50 miles wide, but it's got a, a tremendous current, so we could not dive and hide in, in Lombok Strait. So we had to run it on the surface as a submarine, full speed, and come out on the other side where we could dive and get away from everybody. So we got, it was my one and only big experience where I got depth charged was on the other side of Lombok Strait. And it was a game. Uh, you know, I, I'm, don't forget, I'm the 17 year old kid and we're all sitting around and there was more than, I was not the only one that was in that age bracket. There was a couple of 18s and stuff like that. Some of the lieutenants were pretty young themselves. They're like 22. But uh, we would make bets, $100 we get sunk. Things like that, you know, with the idea in mind that I never want to bet in my life. 
you know, that, that type of thing. And those are the kind of bad jokes, but yet the humor was there. It was a little maybe on the dark side, but it was there. And we made it through, and, and we, we survived the depth charges. And went how, did you, how did you handle the depth charges? It was pretty well, nerve-wracking. Well, uh, I, I, you know, the submarine, whoever was in charge, took us down as deep as we could go, probably 200 feet or something. And the little mosquito boats, you know, the PT boats, had a, a limited range. So it was a question of our creeping out of their range at some depth where they can't... You know, we, they probably only had two or three depth charges on each one of them, you know, if they had any. So how many did they have? You know, I, I couldn't give you a count. I don't remember. But it was, uh, it was okay. And then we, we got into Subic Bay. The Subic Bay had a, an entrance point where there was a net. They put out a net, and we had, to, we had to verify by radio or something that we were coming. And uh, then we had a humorous incident where uh, a radio man, our, we were on the surface approaching Subic Bay. We probably had already radioed our, our code, whatever it is, so the net would be open for us. And, and somebody on the conning tower called down to the radio shack and said, are we all clear? Anything, anything on radar, you know, or blah, blah, blah. And this guy hollered back. You could hear him, you know, over the system. He hollered back, all clear, sir. And, and, and at that moment, he hollered it. You could hear a PBY go by right over the submarine. And I thought, wow, he got transferred off. <laughs> yeah, you didn't see that. <coughs> so our incident in Subic Bay was we tied up. There were no luxury hotels to go to. A relief crew took over. And here we are. We got, you know, 80 guys that are nothing to do for two weeks. You want to know what we did? <laughs> we had a couple of motor machinists decided to go to, there was an Air Force base there near Subic Bay that we were operating on. And they went to the Air Force base and got to ride in a couple of fighter planes as tail gunners. They, they volunteered and they took them. And yeah, we heard about that, and we thought, well, what can we do? And Manila was an open city at the time. And somebody said, well, why don't we go to Manila and see what it's like? I mean, the Japanese are on the outer fringes of it. They were in the mountains, like, retreating and shooting at everybody that was going there. And so we got arms issued, like, not rifles, but yeah. pistols. And we went ashore, and... Uh, we hooked up with an army unit that was going through this pass to Manila. And the other night, I couldn't remember the name of the pass. And she has, my wife has a, a, a friend that's married to a Filipino from Manila. And we called him and he gave me the name of six passes from Subic Bay to Manila. And I said, well, none of those match anything that I can remember. And finally I said, all I can remember about the pass was I'm sitting in a Jeep and I mean, you're going up one hill and then you zig down. I said, that's it. The Army named it Zigzag Pass. It was one of the passes, but they named it themselves. So we went through Zigzag Pass, and sure enough, we suffered. We suffered the sniper thing from the Japanese, and, but nobody got hurt. We went into Manila, crawled around, slept in a bombed-out bank, and tried to find things to do. And uh, eventually we just gave up and got back and back to our ship and went back. And we went all the way back to uh, the ship and went back to Australia. And then we had a leave in Australia because on the way back we, I forgot what we did, we shot up a couple of sandpans and Tokyo Mary, you know, it was broadcasting where our ships were and all that stuff. So what the Japanese did was they equipped some of these small ships with radio contact and they would scream out like if they saw a submarine they'd scream it out over the airwaves that we spotted this and you know so anytime we saw one why we'd we'd uh, get within range and blow it out of the water it was just the thing to do so we went back and got rearmed refurbished and went out on another run and uh, we got involved in a 
taking on a convoy somewhere on the other side in the Sea of Japan one night. Uh, we sank, it was a small DE and three cargo ships. And that happened on the surface at night. And it was kind of interesting because, uh, you know, all I did was hear about it on my phones. Now, you didn't use torpedoes. You used uh, the submarine gun then. No, no. We Torpedo? used torpedoes. And you were on the surface? On the surface, yes. Okay. I mean, uh, that was in a torpedo attack. I mean, we spotted the ships, we tracked them. I, I don't know exactly how they did it other than what I've seen in movies now and all that, but, you know, they plotted it and they fired at it and then the DE came after us after we sank one or two of them and, and we got him and, you know, I, I remember the captain just hollering and screaming how great it felt to finally get, get the war going, you know. And that was a quick run, that was like, 30 or 40 days, you know, and then bam, we're back. <laughs> and then we made one more run and it was incidental. It was, I don't remember exactly. Uh, I think we picked up a survivor on one of the runs, a Japanese guy floating in the water. And by the time we got back to Fremantle with him, uh, he was wearing our clothes and smoking cigarettes and we named him Joe. And then, you know, 12 Marines come with submachine guns to get them off of the boat. <laughs> So when we got back, after you make three runs, there's sort of a, a code, unwritten code in submarines that uh, you have a choice of staying on the submarine or leaving in terms of playing the odds. And uh, a lot of people benefited from that. They got off of a boat after three runs they were on and a boat went out and got sunk, you know, that type of thing. So when we got back, uh, Four or five of us opted to get off, and the war was beginning to draw tight now. And uh, we got appointed master of arms of the headquarters, uh, barracks, you know. In other words, we got, three of us got to be master of arms, and we had our own little room, our own bunks, and we were in charge of seeing that the barracks were kept properly, you know, that type of thing. So the war ended pretty much when we were master of arms. You know, the war ended. Now, how did you know that the bomb was dropped and the war was over? How did you hear about it? Well, the, right. the news that came over on the base from people. You know, I mean, we had access to radio and things like that, and, and submarines were well informed of what was going on in the world. And other guys would come in off of submarines that were active and knew, you know, you had all kinds of information. So the minute it happened, and there was some talk of peace, then it was a question of when will the peace occur? You know, it wasn't, it didn't happen just because they dropped the bomb, it happened afterwards. And uh, so when that happened, why Fremantle became a, everybody in prison was released, whether they were, uh, military prison or any other kind of prison. I mean, the whole area of Fremantle and Perth. Fremantle is sort of a port town and Perth is just up the river from it. A beautiful city, which I took my wife to also. And the submarine base isn't there, but there's a memorial, a torpedo memorial to the United States Submarine Service in Fremantle mounted on a park. And we, we did get Get to see that. And that's about it. That's all you can remember about it. People don't remember the war. Now, when you uh, were there, where did you get shipped to? You shipped back home? To the yeah, LA well, when, when the war was over, you know, we, we, we did what we call cleanup duty. And uh, all of a sudden, people were getting orders to go here and there and there. And then uh, eventually, we got loaded on a, on a uh, <clears throat> troop transport. And uh, the stop from Fremantle, where we got loaded on, we went all the way to Panama on the troop ship. Okay, because you're going to go through the canal? or Yeah, we went okay. through the canal and uh, up the east coast and got off in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It took a while. <laughs> it, was, it was an interesting trip. I think I became a chess expert on the way. <laughs> How come they didn't take you to California? It was so, so much closer. I don't know the answer. See, that's the problem. I mean, 
I know I'm telling you the story, but, but the problem is you're not well informed enough about what went on behind the scenes, that what, what really was the, the motive that, that drove people, the government, or whatever it was to do this or that. Well, now you're in New Hampshire. And in you, New Hampshire, and I got assigned to a submarine called the USS uh, Sea Poacher. And it was, uh, uh, I found out that because I was an electrician, I couldn't get discharged because there was a priority on electricians. And one of the priorities was that I could speak a little German. And there was a lot of conversation about taking the, the ones that could read or write German, and I couldn't read or write it that good, but I could, uh, bring back German submarines to be evaluated by the U.S. Navy here in the United States. So I, I kind of I kind of jumped on that. And it was, it's, all it is is a free trip, you know, back and forth. Did you go to, from... New Hampshire to Germany and back and forth? Yeah, just okay. once. Oh, just once, okay. <laughs> now, were you on a German submarine or were you towing it? No, we were, we were on a German submarine running on the surface. Never, never took it down, down at all. So y your guys were running their submarine then? Right. Okay. Okay. And, and a number of people did that. There's a German submarine in Chicago, yeah, on exhibit, but that's not the one that... Okay. I mean. I've heard that. And then uh, the other, other people brought back, do you remember a story about a, uh, a French submarine, a two-story French submarine at two level? No, never. The Argonaut? Nope. They brought that over, and then we had, we had another one. Uh, oh, gosh, we had one that was two levels. The original one got sunk because I remember working on it in Brisbane. It, went, it, it came back, it had been depth charged, and it was motors were all you know, salt corroded and all that because it had gotten beat up pretty good. And I remember working for the first time in my life with tectochloride and that was, uh, that was bad. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up later. Well, now, you, can I, now you're, you're working after the war bringing, so did these submarines go to Groton or did they go to New Hampshire that were coming from Germany? Where'd they end up at? Well, we brought them back to the Portsmouth, New Hampshire Naval Yard. Okay. And that's where they went from there, I don't know. Okay. They, they, they probably looked them over there and did what they have to do. Well, they were after the ones that were running on hydrogen and uh, things yeah. like that, you know. So, and, and the other thing that we didn't do real well was the snorkel. The Germans, you know, used the snorkel pretty efficiently, and, and we didn't. We didn't use the snorkel at all. It didn't seem like we had, I don't remember using the snorkel. And the other thing that they brought it back for was, what the hell was it? Uh, well, anyway, they wanted to look at it. Now, how much time did you stay in now after the war? How much more time did you have to stay? Well, the war the ended in 45, and I didn't get out until spring of 46. Oh, that long, okay. So I was almost, I was 19 and then turned 20 when I got out almost, after I got out. So the, the the last couple of years, then they had you doing what? Well, just the last. I mean, from the time the war ended, that and I came year. home on a troop ship. That's when the other activity started, and that would have been from forty-five to you know the first late forty-five into the uh, first part of forty-six, and then I got out. Uh, let's say almost midsummer, almost summertime in forty-six. Now, when you got out. Did you go by train directly home? Would you go to New York City or? No, I go? went directly home. And that was that was where again? Directly home. What state? Chicago. Oh, in the city of Chicago, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> Started off there. <clears throat> I feel like I omitted a hundred things, but that's another story. Now we're checking your notes, and and we've got something here we didn't talk about. What is that? Well, the one run I made, we uh, photographed the. Uh, the shores of Japan in anticipation of the invasion of Japan. How close did you get to Japan then? To do well, this? we 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 laid uh, offshore, you know, uh, at night charging our batteries, you know, so we wouldn't be spotted. You know, we were on the surface charging our batteries. You can't do it any other way. And then we would go in at periscope. That and they did all the movie here, filming through the periscope. Can't believe they didn't have boats out there. 
Uh, well, I'm sure they did, but they, I mean, we, whatever precautions we took, we got whatever part of the job we got done. We might have gotten it done badly, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that. So, what the idea? You were close to. You we were, the idea? Yeah, I just wrote down we were shooting the shoreline in Japan for Any the invasion. Any idea how far away from the shore you were in miles? That's the one nice thing about a submarine you is know. I'm sitting in the after torpedo room. You ask me how far am I from the shore? I thought maybe <laughs> it was Skype a buck later. That's interesting. <laughs> True. I think there's something else on the notes we want to talk about. What is it? Well, we had an incident uh, on the submarine where uh, when I mentioned that uh, I slept in the after torpedo room, uh, of course, there's a number of people sleeping in the after torpedo room, and your bed companion usually was a torpedo, and torpedoes were stacked in the torpedo room to be loaded into the tubes when, when needed. So your bunk would slide out from underneath a stacked torpedo, so you would have a torpedo right next to you. And if you were at the head of the torpedo, there was the impeller in the head of the torpedo that armed the torpedo when it was fired out of a torpedo tube. And apparently one of the <laughs> one of the guys in his sleep or something spun the impeller. So when this particular torpedo was fired, it went off prematurely pretty close to the submarine and scared the hell out of everybody because the impact of it going armed it prematurely. Sure. And uh, that was quite an incident on the submarine. I, I remember that one. And, and another incident I remember is that being an electrician, uh, one of my jobs was to water the batteries. You actually, you know, if you recall, you, you got to put some water in the batteries to keep them going. The well, the batteries are uh, under a sub deck in two places. There's a set of batteries underneath the crew's subdeck and there's a set of batteries underneath the officer's subdeck. And I had the one that was underneath the officer's wardrobe and cabins. And I remember being down there and, and you don't have a lot of room and you're working with a pressurized water hose watering the batteries and there's I forgot it, 96 of them in each, water, in each bank. So I had 96 batteries to water, and they are probably five feet tall and two by two <laughs> on the top. So I'm crawling around on top of these batteries, and I get my elbow caught between some place where I, I short circuited and I got an electric shock from the batteries. And I, I, I ripped the hose loose or l ripped the handle loose and the water was spurting out where I couldn't turn it off. So I stuck my head out of the hatch into the officer's wide room with a running hose and uh, I made the cartoon of the week. You know, finally somebody caught it and all that, but it was a very embarrassing moment and a very wet moment for a couple of the officers. <laughs> so that was some of the things that happened, you know. It's just, uh, we had a guy that was good at cartoons, and I made one of his cartoons with that, yeah. No, I was discharged in late 46, yeah. That's it, after I brought the boats back from Germany. What's this about a cook that got seasick? Was that on the submarine? Well, that's the same, yeah, 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 we had, uh, <laughs> when we were going into Subic Bay, uh, uh, I told you about the, the, the radio radar guy, you know, hollering, it's all clear, and he got fired, even though we, he didn't come back on our submarine. And the other one, we had a, a cook that couldn't stand the weaving, you know, and, and he, he just, he was sick all the time. And that got to be pretty nervy <laughs> suffering for people that didn't have a little affliction. But I was lucky I never had that affliction. Especially if he, he's the guy handling your food. Right. Oh, yeah, well, I, we did have, we had privileges that were really over and above. You know, I did get my 
50% finally, and I did get my 20%. And I found out that as a third class petty officer, when I, when I was third class petty officer, my pay was almost as much as a second lieutenant in the Australian Air Force. Isn't that interesting? That's an interesting comparison. How would you even, I would think you would compare it with the captain of the ship and down the line or something. No, and the reason I compared it with an Australian Air Force uh, lieutenant was that <laughs> uh, I fell in love with somebody in Australia. The trouble is the person I fell in love with was in Brisbane when I got transferred to Fremantle. So when I, I got a leave in Fremantle once for 10 days, which I didn't know where to go. So I went over to the Australian Air Force and I said, could I bum a ride to Brisbane? And they said, sure. And, you know, I got on a plane with somebody and flew to Brisbane, you know, like hauling military people around. The trouble is when I started to go back, I wound up in Melbourne. I couldn't get out of Melbourne, so, but the Navy did, U.S. Navy did rescue me and got me back, but I was almost absent without leave, but I wasn't. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot about that. <laughs> anyway, that was another incident. I, I, you know, these are the things that could, uh, what else? I told you about the trip to Manila. Zigzag Pass. I don't have anything else on here. I pretty much covered it. Okay. I know after you leave, I'll remember a couple of things, but they're not written down. Now, when you got back to Chicago, what kind of a career did you take up? <laughs> That's interesting. Uh oh. <laughs> That's another hour interview. <laughs> no, no, don't do that to me. When I got you back to Chicago, of course, I, I. Uh, I elected to collect the uh, 5220, I joined the 5220 club. And I have that, no idea what you know, that means. Well, Maybe people I that know. were discharged after World War II had an option of collecting $20 a week for 52 weeks. And that was based on the assumption that uh, they might not have a job available, not whether they look for it or not. So. The, I collected that, and I don't know if I did the whole 52 weeks, but it allowed me to play a lot of baseball. And as I was playing baseball, I got pretty good at it because I was doing a lot of it, nothing else. And I got hired by the Greyhound Motor and Supply Company, which at that time was the supply house for the Greyhound buses. And they wanted to have a good baseball team. That was all they were after. They didn't care what I did for a living. So that was my career. And, uh, you know, after a couple of years of playing baseball and working for them, uh, I went to a Christmas party and uh, the gentleman that was the head of that company, I can't remember his last name, his first name was Wilbur. Anyhow, they had a Christmas party and like all Christmas parties those days, things were always a little wild than that. And they got out of hand and I didn't get out of hand, but Wilbur, got a little loose and asked me what I did. What did I do besides play baseball for them? You know, and I Wait a minute, who's Wilbur? He's the chief, oh. pet, chief officer that ran the company. Okay. It was in his office that the party was. Okay. And uh, he, he asked me, what did I do besides play baseball? And I said, well, not much. I'm, a, I'm an order picker or something like that. He said, well, he says, you're a veteran. He says, you ought to go take advantage of the GI Bill. He said, did you ever finish high school? I said, no. He says, well, you can finish high school and go to college. And with his prompting and a little help from him, not necessarily financial, but just push, mm -hmm. uh, he got me thinking about it. And uh, I was, I just got married, you know, and my wife, my first wife was working in her dad's store. And I said, well, I'll go to college then, you know. So I, I got the GED and passed high school. And then I started at the University of Illinois in, uh, Chicago at Navy Pier, and uh, I tell you, it was a struggle. I uh, I struggled the first year, but I got through it. And I found out that I found out that they don't grade like they did in high school with numbers. They grade by uh, the curve, you know. I mean, like I had a five-hour course, and I wound up with a 55 in it, and I got an A. And I went to the professor, and I said, "Did you mind telling me how I got an A?" 
He said the 55 was the best mark in the class. I said, well, what happens to the rest of the people? Well, they mark on a, on a curve. You know, in college, you, you knew that, didn't you? No. No? Well, not everybody does, but apparently they did. Or that's the way it was done there. But uh, in, in a lot of places, when you're in a class, uh, your class grade depends on how you react with the rest of the people in your class. An A could be a 55 or it could be a 95 if somebody had a 95. If I had a 55 and there was a 95 in a class, I would have got a D, hmm. the curve. <laughs> but so, hey, I was happy. I got good grades and all that. So I decided that I, I better go on. And uh, so I went to the university in Champaign and decided I was going to be a CPA, which I didn't, I didn't, I got everything except I didn't practice. I, I got to be a CPA, but you have to get a license and do all that stuff. And, and uh, I didn't want to take a job for it couple of hundred bucks a month being a CPA. <laughs> so I, I evolved into uh, working for the Pillsbury Company in, in Minneapolis. Not in Minneapolis proper, but working for the Pillsbury Company. And uh, they touted me into Doing being, what for them? Huh? Doing what for Pillsbury? Uh, I became an experiment on their part to hire someone and make him a grain merchandiser, buy and sell grain without going through the apprentice journalist routine. In other words, normally over the years, people that became grain buyers and sellers had to serve as an apprentice for two years with somebody and then go on and do something else. And sure. so this, this way they hired a, an accountant that had been trained in accounting. And I, I told you I had the CPA license, but I didn't use it. And I, I was good with numbers, so they made me a grain merchandiser right off the bat. And I went to work in, uh, how the hell did I start? Ah, Clinton, Iowa. And I, I went to work for their soy division in Clinton, Iowa. And from there I got promoted and transferred to Chicago Board of Trade, where I became a, a, a hustler. <laughs> working for Pillsbury on the Board of Trade. And then graduated and got sent to Wichita, Kansas, where I actually did a lot of buying and selling of grain in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, I made myself a reputation as someone that could buy grain and move it somewhere and get it done. So the French company in Paris had an office in New York and they hired me and I flew to New York and became a, an international merchandiser <laughs> and uh, I stayed in New York until I I got summoned by PV Company which is a competitor of Pillsbury's in in Minneapolis you know PV mills PV flour mills and they wanted to get into the export business in in Houston so uh, they propositioned me to come to work for them with my expert in overseas trading and all that stuff, and I did. And uh, wound up running an office down there, guy and a girl, you know, nothing special, but I was hauling out ships of grain and bringing in grain and having a lot of fun. And, and uh, finally, uh, they couldn't keep it up. I mean, I, I don't know how they explain that, but PV, PV wasn't ready for the international scene on a broad basis. So they decided to pull back and, and in order to save me, they wanted to save me, they sent me to Kansas City to be the assistant manager in the Kansas City office. And they had elevators in Kansas City and things like that. And the guy I was an assistant to was an old friend of mine. And I found out that uh, the reason I was there was because he was not making the grade. So I didn't know that until I got there. You know. So I wound up, uh, they put him out to pasture and made me the manager. And I'm wheeling and dealing, uh, trading in the futures pit like they did in, Ch in Chicago and stuff like that. And before you know it, I, I pulled something off and they said, you can't do that. And it wasn't illegal or anything. It was just something new. They never heard of it. Uh, I don't know if I can explain it to you, but it was a, uh, are you familiar with grain? 
not when it comes to selling. Not when well, it comes to selling Ukraine. Uh, for years, you know, the, the government has been, CCC has been storing grain for people, whether it's farmers or companies yeah. or what have you not. And you store grain under certain grade stipulations, you know. And two yellow corn, the, the title of two yellow corn says you have to have 15.5 moisture or less, okay? And so when you store grain for the government, you have a big elevator and you put in millions of bushels, you know, and you tell them that I got your grain and I'll guarantee it it's gonna stay two yellow corn like you put it in 15.5 moisture or less. Well, in the meantime, you know, you, you have gotten grain and you have mixed it up and you got it down to where it's only 14% or 13.5%. So all of a sudden I got millions of bushels of grain that's 2% less and a half a percent of moisture and a bushel of corn can be worth anywhere from a half a cent to a cent to two cents depending on the condition of what's going on in the world at the time. So when I found out that I had all of this dry corn, I put a premium value on the corn I had versus what I owed, which gave me Boku money. I increased the value of my inventory, you know. And they got mad at me and called me to Minneapolis and fired me on the spot. And I got drunk, went home, and uh, I wound up, I had a buddy that his son was just going to Vietnam and he had bought him a membership on the Board of Trade in Kansas City. And he says, I'll let you use it till you get your feet back on the ground. Well, it, it, was, a, it was a gold mine to me. I mean, within six months I had bought my own membership and gave him back his and before you know it I had my own company and I was off and running. Wonderful story. Whatever happened to the submarine you were on? The submarine I was on, okay, good story. As you mentioned, as she mentioned, uh, my wife is, is my second wife and I had taken her everywhere with my son to submarine conventions, whatever, wherever they are. And, and I took her to uh, Hartford, Connecticut to a submarine convention. You know, the U.S. sub vets were a dying organization because you had to be in World War II in order to belong to it. But that's, that's been changed. Uh, you just have to be in submarines no matter where, where they are. Anyway, I took her there and uh, one, of the, one of the deals that they had at the convention was that we could go to New London and get on a nuclear submarine, which I had never been on, you know. So, uh, your question, I lost it now. What happened to your submarine? Oh. So we go to New London and we get on a nuclear submarine and we get the tour and all this stuff. And we come out and we're going all around Groton to Met and there's a there is a USS Croker tied up at, at a dock. It's a it's a freak show. Some guy bought it and and put it out there as an exhibit and it cost fifty cents to get in. And I couldn't believe it. We get over there and I tell the guy I was on this thing. He says, Well you get on for free then. <laughs> So it was there, and I don't know how long it stayed there, but it must have been a, a thorn in somebody's side because they finally got rid of it and moved it to Buffalo, New York, and it's on exhibit there as a survivor of World War II, you know, a, a, you know, a nice thing. It's in Buffalo somewhere, and that's where it's at. And, uh, my wife couldn't believe it. I took her to the after torpedo room, and I said, that's where I used to sleep. <laughs> But they had it, you know, it was nice. It was laid out nice. Yeah, well, that's unusual to have a happy ending like that. That's a great story. Great story. <laughs> Thanks for taking the afternoon to do this for me. Well, I don't know. I, You know, you're going to edit it and all that, so. Well, I'll be spending some time on it.